Okay, sure. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Biplav, and uh, this is my small team. Uh, and uh, what uh, we are talking about is uh, environmental decision support. And we have released a bunch of apps uh, in the Play Store. You can go through them also. Um, OK, so this work is in uh, partnership with a whole bunch of people. Um, within IBM, we have been developing core technology uh, across multiple labs. Uh, we have explored this on different river bodies, uh, uh, focused on India. So in the Hinden, we have focused on agriculture use case. This, some of this will make sense as I go a little deep, but uh, I want to acknowledge uh, on agriculture. Um, we have also looked at the general exploration of water bodies. So this is on Yamuna, and then uh, on uh, as a tourism promotion on long river bodies. So India being a very old civilization, people live next to the river, and there's a lot of religious activities happening next to the river. And finally, we have done some work uh, in close collaboration with uh, Professor Tambe's group. So I'll talk a little bit about that. <coughs> OK, so uh, just as a caveat, we are not water quality experts. So we are. Uh, we know about uh, data. We know about a little bit about analysis of it. Uh, we know. Uh, we we have access to um, a specialist in sensor network and so on. But uh, we have been relying on really experts, water quality experts, to more no, to know more. So the main message I want to give, and this is a very short talk. Um, so is that common citizens they want to make better decisions with water. Eventually, whatever we are doing, we are sensing, or whatever information we are collecting, eventually the main theme has to be that people should be able to take better decisions, data-driven decisions. Otherwise, you are, uh, uh, it doesn't matter whatever you do, because they will bypass you. Okay? And as to help that, what we have done is we have uh, released a bunch of apps, uh, making sure that the data and the decisions uh, aids are available to people. One of them is just about the uh, what kind of water I, am, I have in front of me. And the second one is, how can I contribute my perception of the water quality to people? So that's, uh, and uh, uh, this is built around uh, an infrastructure. And uh, what we have done is we have taken multi-sensor data. So there is a whole history of uh, water collection, uh, water quality collection, data collection, where people go into the water bodies, they take samples, and they report information. But much of it was just kept in reports, paper reports, and so on. It was not accessible to common man. The second one is that real-time sensors are becoming very uh, prevalent. And uh, so, so we want to help in gaining that data. The third is people want to contribute and, and say about my quality of water is good, bad, it is smelling, and so on. So there is a qualitative and there is a quantitative aspect of data. And we want to bring both of them together. Okay. And eventually, we have done some work, but we are, of course, looking for ways to scale this. So um, for people who are not aware of what's happening in the water area, um, the earlier model was that you would have manual data collection. Then these data would be left in isolation into different reports, databases, and so on. And then there would be guess estimation tools about what is the de water demand, what is the water supply. And the pricing has been commodity pricing, and the people are solving from one, um, uh, one disaster to another disaster. So now this area is moving towards automated sensing. Uh, across domains, people are collaborating. Uh, there's more data integration, and value-based pricing, and so on is happening. So this is essentially what we are trying to enable in the water ecosystem. So if you look at a water body uh, in India, and these are from um, Ganga, which is the, one of the largest river um, in the world, um, and also a very polluted river. Uh, just to, by giving by way of uh, analogy, uh, the whole population of US lives on the Ganga Basin. Okay. And that's just one of the rivers. So uh, <clears throat> the kind of questions that one may want to ask is, um, you know, as an individual, can I take a bath in this river? The second is, if I have farm, can I actually use water from this uh, river and, f uh, and, and uh, irrigate my f uh, field? Okay. And uh, as a business use case might be that, uh, you know, I have sewage treatment plants. Um, how should I? Should I uh, get more electricity to that? Or where should I design my new uh, sewage treatment plants? And so on. And today, the information about this, it would be you can go to one of the uh, EPA equivalent agencies, and you can go to their website, look for some data. You will get a pH and so on. You get some numbers. Okay. 
and by standards they have about 35 uh, measurable quantities that people will say you should measure and uh, but the information is all in website and so on so can we make these insights right which people care about uh, really available to them so in this context i want to uh, so uh, we have tried to attack this with the one app which we have released called ganga watch and uh, this is just a screenshot i am going to show a small video So the app is available on the Android Play Store, but there is a reason why it is only in the Indian domain. Okay, if anyone is interested, I can give you the APK. The reason is the name uh, is uh, very similar to a prohibited substance in the US, and so <laughs> there is a little bit of name clearance and all that we have to do. And I kind of refuse to change the name of the river. So, you want to play that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is a quick thing I can pause please yeah so this is the Indian uh, River basin Ganga basin what you are seeing is about uh, 60 odd places on the basin where we had historical data from people who had collected from the SAM, uh, from the field and then they had reported it and it's all open data they have put it on that platform slightly more please so we are zooming in on one of the places and you can just select it and this demo is on my laptop, uh, on my mobile also. So now, just can you pause here, please? Sure. Yeah. So what, uh, so what you are noticing is that in older days, people would collect data once a quarter, perhaps. Okay. And that is the granularity at which it was reported. So for this place, we have for 12 data uh, points. Okay. We have 12 data points collected every quarter. There are about 35 different parameters: dissolved oxygen and pH and so on. There is something called the purpose, okay? Why are you looking at this water? Is it for drinking? Is it for irrigation? Is it for uh, pulp industry? Is it for uh, tanning, tannery industry and so on? The parameters are different. Uh, and there are again other guidelines which talk about those parameters. People just didn't know how to map them. Other is the limits. What are safe limits and unsafe limits? So uh, for this turbidity, for example, more than five is unsafe. Um, dissolved oxygen, uh, less than six is unsafe okay so the, and, and uh, we, we, can, we are reporting what is safe and what is unsafe and you can play with this information so in contrast what you didn't have before right all, the, all of this information was in reports and so on now it is easily available in your handily no, yeah there's a little bit of exploration about the purposes I already talked to you just pause here so we ch chose drinking and now you're looking at what are the uh, parameters which are relevant and please play again now, uh, so now what we can also do is the variation with time and so on. So this is all old data. Now we have also gone into water and we have collected new real-time data. And there is a little bit of trick that we have not working only with stationary data, but uh, uh, using boat, we are collecting, we have gone into the river body, collected data along the river body, and then we have uploaded it. So that's what you're seeing. Uh, pause, please, for a minute. Yeah. So if you noticed, uh, OK. So this is an old video, but uh, we went um, in uh, December of last year uh, into one of the river bodies. And uh, this is the Yamuna, which is in the capital region. And what we have is, along the, as the boat is going on, we have a real-time sensor. And we are collecting data at, every, uh, at a granularity of every second. Okay? So we have meter granularity data. And uh, again, the similar kind of information. And, uh, I will go a little more into the analytics and what we can make out of this and other data sets. And so you can see nice variations over time and space. OK, that's it, I think. Yeah, please. Thank you. So this was, in some summary, what uh, you already saw. And um, I mentioned about use cases. So drinking is not the only use case. If you have water quality information, you can use in many, many areas. Uh, you can use it just to validate the, your data collection. So that is uh, one way. And um, another is the bathing and such kind of individual activities. Um, it is also what crops can I grow? 
Okay. It turns out that people are very conscious about the quality of vegetables that they are producing. And, and the farmers, if they know that their water, yeah, if the water is not good, then what they would do is they will actually be willing to switch from river water to groundwater. And sometimes groundwater is better than the river water access. Okay. So, and so on. So what I will do in the remaining time which I have is talk about two areas. Uh, one is about a pollution level analysis and also another one is on source attribution okay, using water data. So these are the two which we have worked on, but uh, you can also be doing wildlife and sewage treatment and so on. So, uh, so this is uh, what I call the art of the possible. So tanneries is, um, so when you wear leather, so leather hide, you know, it has needs to be processed and one of the outcome of that is chromium. And uh, uh, in fact, one of the cities in India, uh, Kanpur, it is one of the leaders in uh, leather products. Uh, it employs uh, more than 100,000 people. It brings in more than a billion dollar in revenue. And uh, the problem is that it pollutes a lot, okay, chromium. And in fact, uh, there is very little data. Uh, courts, which are environmental courts, they have been extremely frustrated and they have said, we'll ban the whole industry. So this is about, you know, without data, people are taking knee-jerk reactions. So can we do something better? So in this kind of scenario, uh, I'm, I don't have enough time to go into the details, but what we looked at was, um, in, in partnership with USC, was uh, where can we have the, if there are these uh, factories or the tanneries, right, and there are different states, uh, sorry, sites, how can someone, the, the, the inspectors, they can go and look at and inspect these sites so that they can find violations. The thing is, if, if you don't have any technology, then you, uh, whatever you inspection you do, people can claim that you are being biased. So they get into various uh, issues and uh, the purpose of that inspection is not met, right? So can, we, can you be punitive and also you can be fair? So that's uh, one of the work and in fact, uh, this is a very, um, I mean, considered very promising by the people who are in the center of the things. The other one, which is a very recent work, is uh, I mentioned about people interacting with water bodies. So we have this uh, notion of kum and earth kum. Um, close to 200 million people, they came to next to Haridwar, which is one of the places, second, uh, three, third year city in India, over the last three months. And, uh, and uh, they were taking a dip in the water. And there are days in this three month when you know um, millions of people come and there are other days where about thousands of people come, tens of thousands of people come. And the idea is can we actually predict what is the water quality and how can you manage crowd and things like that, okay? So in this kind of situation, uh, of course uh, the water, it, there are different limits for drinking, bathing and irrigation. Okay, how much uh, does human activity impact and where is the impact highest? So because this is a whole river and there are multiple places where people are coming, so can we do something about it? And this is a very busy chart, but using our method of real-time sensing and uh, uh, validating it with the uh, photos which are taken by the another app, what we have is now in, for different days, okay, so this is where the river stretch is coming on, for different parameters, okay, we have a heat map which was generated from the data that we collected. More importantly, in the last two columns, so the last column is a way of coming up with water quality index, which is uh, weighted, uh, some weighted some of the violations on the other degrees, on the other parameters. And finally, we can talk about at the level of good water and bad water, okay. Uh, and, and so this, there's a paper which we have just submitted on this work. and. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is one of the first uh, view of in a highly, uh, I mean, uh, uh, with a large number of people converging on river bodies, right? What is the impact on water? So there is a lot about the, the data collection and management, how we do it. Um, I'll invite you to look at um, one of the, uh, the site we have is called Blue Water, where we have put all this information together. Um, I will just end by pointing out a few things. So we have an um, architecture where we have uh, multiple data coming from multiple sensors. We are putting on a cloud infrastructure. And uh, we, uh, this, uh, inf uh, we will have a REST interface available through which you can, people can access this data. Uh, 
there are some research challenges with respect to sensing, qualitative and quantitative sensing, data sensing, and how you put this information together. Finally, how we can deliver analytics to people and incentivize conservation behavior. So we have just scratched the surface. Uh, as a call for action, what I would like people to say is uh, join the open data movement, which is where you are actually contributing data back to uh, society. And you can contribute data using some of the apps. In US, we have a Creek Watch app, which uh, had been running for the last four or five years and uh, on iOS. So we needed to create another one because we needed it on Android and there were other issues. Uh, and so Ganga Watch app, as I already mentioned, and really get involved by focusing on some water use case and contributing back. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so I'm actually a criminologist, and uh, two of the cases that you mentioned on there were very near and dear to the work that I do, which is I look at corporate crime and I look at organized crime. Okay. So one of the cases that you talked about, the leather factory, is dead on. So the question that I have for you is you have all this data. Are you sharing it with the academic community so that they can apply theoretical frameworks and assess it from our discipline to take that further? Right. Um, and also, the other question is, I gave a talk yesterday on illicit sand mining, and what is that doing to the river bodies mm -hmm. and, and things like that? So, if I know we're, we don't have a lot of time now, but if possible, I'd like to have a chat with you uh, and, and see if any of that stuff can be um, looked at as well in terms of water quality. Okay, so on the first one, the data, definitely we are making it available. Uh, the, uh, I mean, in the app itself, you can see the contributor data that is out, okay. Uh, the, the sensor data, we are making it available as part of a REST interface. So there is a Blue Water website where we will be making it available. So there's a little bit of data sanitization that we have to do. Uh, on the second one, definitely I'm open to uh, discussing with that. It's a little tricky. Sand mining can be very violent uh, crime area. So, but that's <laughs> that thing apart. Citizen <laughs> science is not possible. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you.